Hello and welcome. You're watching Good Morning India. I'm Karki Rawat. Stay with us for all the news you need to start your day with. We'll get to the latest situation in Afghanistan and also vaccines as soon for children in India. Let's take a look at the headlines we're tracking. Foreign Minister Jay Shankar says India is carefully following the developments in Afghanistan. The priority is to ensure the safe return of Indians there. The International Monetary Fund has announced it will block Afghanistan's access to emergency reserve worth $460 million as the Taliban has taken control. Calcutta High Court is set to deliver its verdict on the controversial post-poll violence case in Bengal. The and we bring you the highlights from the Prime Minister's interaction with the Olympians. The Prime Minister joked with Neeraj, can I auction this javelin? First up, External Affairs Minister Jay Shankar has said that India's priority is to ensure the safe return of Indians who are stuck in Afghanistan. He says the evolving situation is being closely watched here and that the relationship with the Afghan people continues and that will guide India's approach in coming days. At the moment, uh, we are, like everybody else, very carefully following developments in Afghanistan. Uh, I think our focus... Uh, is on uh, ensuring the uh, security uh, in Afghanistan and the safe return of Indian nationals who are there. Uh, so that is really what has been uh, uh, very much the uh, focus of my own engagements uh, here. You use the word investment. I mean, for us, it reflected what was a historical relationship with the Afghan people. Uh, I think that relationship with the Afghan people obviously continues and uh, that will guide our uh, approach to Afghanistan uh, in the coming days. We are uh, looking at uh, what is the situation, evolving situation uh, in Kabul. Uh, obviously the Taliban and its representatives have uh, come to Kabul, so I think we need to take it on from there. So thank you again very much. So India's dilemma is whether to engage with the Taliban or not. The Prime Minister has chaired a second meeting of the Cabinet Committee on Security in two days yesterday. Can India trust the Taliban? Sanket Upadhyay reports. So should India engage with the Taliban or not? Well, as of this moment, it seems that the sense in the establishment is that we are playing a wait and watch game because the dilemma is whether we should engage and recognize with the Taliban or not. Uh, this is a huge dilemma because what bothers India is a Taliban-Pakistan-China nexus. This time around China is in the mix. So India, uh, the, the sense within the establishment is whether our interests will be protected in uh, Afghanistan and also whether Afghani soil will be used uh, uh, to carry out terror activities or not. Fears of Taliban prevailing terror in JK, Punjab and Kerala is a huge matter of concern which has been raised by various MPs also. Cabinet Committee on Security met on Tuesday and Wednesday in which... Uh, one of the key things that was addressed that our top priority is that we should evacuate all the Indians who are stranded in Afghanistan. Apart from that, also offer refuge to Afghan Hindus as well as Afghan Sikhs as well. So this is also a factor which is playing on the mind. Sources also say that the government wants to avoid an immediate hawkish position on Taliban because they feel that that may not work because we have to uh, make sure that our interests are protected in Afghanistan and that is also a major cause of concern. We have also learned from sources that major key strategic commentators uh, who somewhat toe the government's line have also been told not to comment on the government, uh, government's possible engagement or no engagement with the Taliban. Uh, that is also something that we have learned. One of the things which is fresh in public memory is the horrors of Kandahar, And that is the biggest fear as of this moment, not just in, among the establishment, but also among the people. People still, that memory, public memory of 1999 is still fresh. Now the UK envoy to India, Alex Ellis, tweeted, the situation in Afghanistan is very grave. UK and India have a prominent role to play in the international community's response.
Well, to talk more about the situation in Afghanistan as well as uh, India's response, we're joined by Dr. Zakir Hussain, former senior fellow at the Indian Council of World Affairs, and Dr. Shweta Singh, a political and policy analyst. Thank you so much uh, for joining us, Dr. Zakir Hussain. First to you, uh, comment on India's response, because right now it's a wait and watch situation to see what sort of shape uh, the government eventually takes. Uh, this is the right policy, I think, and uh, we should not be much worried about because uh, over the period of time, much balancing forces will emerge where we will get to work uh, with different faction as well as the Taliban. And uh, much depend on the legitimacy of Taliban international affair. And now uh, the role of US and European countries and NATO countries is very important, how they define the Taliban's and their actions. On that basis, we should move in along with the international community. So we have laws, we have stakes. But our stakes are not so that they are going to destroy our developmental activities because uh, they also need that uh, dam, road, bridges, education, capacity building. They want this. Thing. And uh, one thing is that uh, if international uh, donor agencies or World Bank, IMF are not uh, going there to help Afghanistan from where they will get money. Again, they will go to poppy culture, drug culture in that. And uh, definitely Taliban does not want to go back to that period and uh, naturally they, they need donors who can help them out because uh, you, uh, nine billion dollar is uh, in u.s control so these are various issues which will force taliban to reconsider their policies of re-engaging with the old allies now of course the situation and the formula and pattern will be different this time but uh, i don't think that afghanistan or taliban or whoever is coming to power or government they can ignore india uh, because we also know that Pakistan is there, but it is not in a position to help economically. China is there, but it is it is doing a resource diplomacy. It is giving aid, but in terms of getting their resources. Uh, uh, Russia is there, but it is more of a stabilizing and security nature. Uh, but in long term, sustaining the country, in long term, medium term, Afghanistan and Taliban need economic help. So India should not worry much. Um, very much uh, and uh, in the coming days I think that uh, at least for six months we should remain silent and uh, we, sh we should wait and watch. All right, you think th they'll have no uh, choice but to involve India at some point? Dr. Shweta Singh, your views? Yeah, I, I um, actually, hi Gargi, I don't agree with your previous um, speaker. I think there are a couple of issues that the government is going to have to take a note of. Um, one of those issues is human rights, especially for women and children. I don't of think course. we can. I don't think we should wait and watch on that. I don't think that's fair or ethical, given the global world we live in. And also because, um, you know, we are part of the Indian subcontinent. We are part of South Asia. It is closer to us than it is to the U.S. And uh, India is one of the um, major democracies in the region. And I think it can hold Afghanistan um, uh, and the current government or if you want to call it that accountable so that's part one and then secondly i um i don't think we can anticipate what they will do you know anyone who's going to look at the status no, as it's sure. a brand new status we're you know, waiting, we're waiting and watching but you know going for i mean of course human rights and the rights of women is a huge concern but uh, currently you know india is remaining uh, silent we've said we're watching the situation unfold we we showed what Jay, uh, what uh, foreign minister jay shankar said and said we're watching uh, he talked about the people of afghanistan the relationship that india has and you know that is something that will guide us uh, forward no, they will guide us forward. But, you know, we we as a country and I don't I also think that Dr. Jay Shankar is a very savvy person. So he's probably going to India does have a plan. I'm positive about it. But we can't presume that this is a point zero. This is not point zero. Right. This has happened before. 2004 is when this new constitution came in. So we don't know what the constitution is going to look like moving forward. Whatever they had before, actually the 2004 constitution is 1964 constitution rehashed. So my point is, we this is a very volatile situation. This is a very changing by the minute situation. There are going to be multiple players just because the U.S. has pulled out its physical presence more or less and policy wise seems to have made a strong decision does not mean that there is not going to be other players or that the u.s is not going to be interested my personal perspective is that there's going to be multiple players they are going to be engaged because at this point of time in 2021 right after the pandemic right of this the whole you know global effort towards coping 
I don't think the world is going to bail on the people of Afghanistan so easily. I, I don't think so. Right, uh, Dr. Hussain, uh, also, uh, you know, the UK envoy, his statement saying that UK and India have a prominent role to play you know, in the international community's response. And that is where we can work right now with the international community, keeping an eye and ensuring, you know, that we demand uh, that uh, human rights uh, and, and the protection of women be observed uh, in Afghanistan. Yes, uh, this, is the, this is what I, I, I am pointing, that... Uh, uh, we should cooperate with the international community and work with them how they take Taliban, how Talibans behave in the coming because uh, when their mask of new Taliban is going down and when they are retreating back to their uh, Taliban one period and uh, this is much, this will be much more to the world to witness because economically they cannot sustain, politically they cannot sustain, they cannot prevent civil war if they, if they do excesses with their uh, public, faction war will start there. So Afghanistan saying this that Taliban are going to stabilize Afghanistan at this is at this stage is premature. Uh, if it, Afghanistan needs a lot of time to stabilize and for this it needs a international cooperation and India is indispensable for them because of being uh, proximate to uh, because India was also trying to break Pakistan, uh, Afghanistan landlock position through Chabar and all this and bringing to the world and South Asian economy and Central Asian economy and this will be giving the economic benefit to Afghanistan. The, if, if Talibans are going to, and I am, I am also definite that uh, at the moment Pakistan, China and uh, Afghan, uh, Russia are holding uh, Taliban, but in the coming days that much hold will not exist. Uh, right. Taliban will try to uh, become independent, auto, seek autonomy to develop their countries, to run their countries. If they are going to sit in the, in the lap of these countries, uh, then definitely world is not going to accept. Right. So these are various concerns we have to take into our consideration and on that basis government should run. But the first priority right now is to protect the lives of our citizens and bring them back. Right, and in that too I found that Taliban is, Talibans are cooperating and sending some positive signals but not that much what we expect. Right. Uh, the priority is to get the Indians out from there. Uh, Dr. Shweta Singh, a lot has been made about, you know, the Taliban this time around, you know, so to speak, or uh, trying to play the optics, right, trying to show that perhaps they have changed. But already we've had some, you know, incidents of uh, firing and protests in Jalalabad. So uh, what is your view of this? You know, you, you, my view is going to be a little bit an outlier view, but I don't think there's a single entity in the world at this point of time which has any kind of a public presence and doesn't have a propaganda management team. Nothing. Sure. And so what someone says, a communication, is no longer a benchmark of what they will actually do. Only actions are. And uh, I mean, if you look at the most top players also, right, how has uh, US is the world leader? How have they mapped out what they say they have done? Now, I think Taliban has that compulsion. I don't think it is going to be easy for it to have the practices from 96 to 2001, which is the time when, you know, which was really, really terrifying for all the people there. So I hope that they are going to come through. But like I said, I think it's such a volatile situation. There is no government there. Their president has run away without, you know, their armed forces gave away. So there is there is no compulsion. You know, there is no compulsion that we can point out and say this is the reason why they will behave. They have enough resources, natural resources for them to last for a while. There are enough partners that they have in uh, several nations that they could survive if they wanted to without changing anything about their internal domestic politics. So I think they are also playing to a couple of different angles. I think what we have seen, you know, as lay right. people is the outcome. We don't know what the process was behind this movement. It surprised you. It surprised all you know, people who are analysts, I'm sure it surprised the women based on how the journalists are reacting. If you look at their reactions, women from Afghanistan were so well connected, right? I was reading how they are in tears because they're just so taken aback. So if these empowered people did not know what's happening, what are the odds that um, the people there know what is happening? I think this is going to play out. And I actually agree with the fact that we have to take a little bit of a backseat and see how it plays out but i don't think it's going to play out in the timeline we are thinking this is not a six month thing right. it's more like a you know a few years down the line we will know what we're talking about all right well thank you so much for joining us and right now the focus one point one point yes. i want to make uh Ghani's presence in abu dhabi shows that uh, something is is happening now
uh, Abu Dhabi has given asylum, you can say that, uh, yes. to Ghani. That means the Muslim country, Muslim world is also looking Taliban in a very different manner now. How they behave, these are various unfolding dynamics which will be very sure. much obvious in the coming days. The Calcutta High Court is set to deliver its verdict on the controversial post-polar violence case in Bengal today. A five-judge bench had reserved its order on the 3rd of August in the case examining the charge of allegations of Trinamool violence against BJP after uh, the polls ended on the 2nd of May with a thumping win for Mamta Banerjee. The court ordered an HRC probe into the allegations, but its report turned controversial after its report claimed that the Bengal police had turned a blind eye on rapes and murders in the state after polls. Mamta Banerjee dismissed the NHRC report claiming it was biased as members of its team were publicly known to be BJP loyalists. News now from the northeast and Shillong where the curfew imposed on the 15th of August was relaxed for the first time yesterday, four days after sporadic violence and also saw petrol bomb being hurled at the personal residence of the chief minister and the governor's convoy targeted. Locals are distur in the disturbed area have decided not to join the peace committee set up by the Meghalaya government until the government suspends senior police officials who they blame for the death of a rebel leader who had surrendered in 2018. Ratnadeep Chaudhary reports. Curfew relaxed in Shillong for 11 hours, markets open, taxis back on the roads for the first time since 15 August when the violence erupted over the killing in a police raid of surrendered rebel leader Chesterfield. Thank you. With a curfew relaxed, Shillong is limping back to normalcy, but there is an uneasy calm with sentiments high about the manner in which the former militant leader was gunned down by the police. In the Mola area of Shillong, where violence broke out on Sunday, people are back on the street, along with the central forces on patrol. But the crucial meeting between the government and the locality representatives has not broken the ice. Locals have issued an ultimatum. The government, they say, must act against the police officers in the controversial raid within seven days. That until unless you suspend or book this culprit, these two murderers, these two police who led the, the mothers, the barbaric and on the, on the morning of 13. So we will come and we will have uh, a seat in, this, in that peace committee. So we told the chief minister that you should retain the trust of the public, of the Maulai. You should show the sincerity, the capable that you have. As the CM, you can lead the state. The opposition Congress is also gunning for the chief minister, who is keeping up a brave face and even defending the police. Even before the independent inquiry is notified, the chief minister has been giving statement, defending the police and talking about the circumstances. It's not inconsistent with what is expected. We have been now reaching out to a uh, large number of uh, uh, seniors, citizens of society, the headmen's, the different organizations and to a large extent uh, we have been able to positively uh, move forward in this. That's why today you have seen a relaxation in the curfew. We have uh, in fact put in a judicial inquiry and he had in fact himself uh, mentioned in the letter that a judicial inquiry should be put in. When everything is um, you know uh, okay. Uh, the uh, uh, general sense um, uh, don't realize uh, or uh, individuals don't realize the amount of work that the police is putting in to ensure that there is calmness and peacefulness. The tension in Shillong is tangible. The crisis for the government far from over. In Shillong with cameras and Sanjay Chakravarti, Ratnadeep Chaudhary, Findy TV. Will India have a woman chief justice in 2027? Well, the way things stand, B.V. Nagaratna, who is currently a judge in the Karnataka High Court, could just be the chief justice then. Here are the details. This is India's highest court of justice. Yet, it has never had a woman chief justice in the last 74 years. But that may finally change when 58-year-old Justice B.V. Nagaratna may become the first woman chief justice of India. She is currently a judge in the Karnataka High Court. Her name is among eight judges and one lawyer recommended for the elevation to the top court and includes two other women. These recommendations have been made by the Collegium led by CGI N.V. Ramana and four other senior most judges of the Supreme Court. These have been sent to the government which will finally approve and then the President will sign the appointment warrants. 
but there is no time limit on approval and there have been instances in the past where the government has sent back these recommendations seeking clarifications if justice bv nagaratna becomes the chief justice of india she will be following in the footsteps of her father es venkatramaiya who was chief justice of india between june and december 1989 while hearing a divorce petition in december last year she said india's patriarchal society doesn't know how to treat empowered women parents don't teach their sons how to treat an empowered woman earlier this year while hearing a case on midday meals justice nagaratna said nobody can study on a hungry stomach and rejected a state government proposal to withdraw midday meals in schools which were in covid hotspots However she is likely to have only a month long tenure in 2027 as there is a long line of succession before her which is decided on the basis of seniority Presently Justice Indira Banerjee is the only woman judge in the top court and there have only been 8 women judges appointed in the Supreme Court in the last 74 years Justice Hema Kohli became the first woman to hold the post of Chief Justice of Telangana High Court in January this year and justice bela trivedi is presently a judge in the gujarat high court other names recommended by the collegium are senior advocate and former additional solicitor general in the nda government ps narsimha if selected he will be the only direct appointee from the bar to the supreme court justice abhay shrinivas oka justice vikram nath justice jk maheshwari justice c t ravi kumar and justice mm M. sundaresh very much the supreme court is currently program. functioning with nine I vacancies which will rise to 10 with the retirement of justice navin sinha there have been demands for a woman chief justice of india former cgi sa bobde had said that the time has come for india to have its first woman chief justice current cgi nv ramana has also said that it is time for a woman to head the judiciary in new delhi this is sukirti dwedi for ndtv Now, Congress MP Shashi Tharoor was cleared by Delhi court on Wednesday of charges in the case involving the death of his wife Sunanda Pushkar after the pronouncement of the order Mr Tharoor said it's been 7 and a half years of absolute torture One of India's most sensational cases the mysterious death of 51 year old Sunanda Pushkar found dead in her hotel suite at the Leela Hotel in Delhi while her husband The articulate MP, author, and ex-UN official Shashi Tharoor was attending an All India Congress session in New Delhi, along with the then Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, the Gandhis, and the entire Congress leadership. Seven and a half years later, Judge Geetanjali Goel refused to accept a Delhi Police charge sheet, which said Shashi Tharoor should be investigated for abetment to suicide and cruelty in her death. A relieved Shashi Tharoor's first response came with him saying, "Most grateful your honor, it's been 7 and a half years of absolute torture. I really appreciate it." He then released a statement, underlined that in our justice system the process is all too often the punishment. Describing the charges levied against him by the Delhi police as preposterous, Tharoor said, "This brings a significant conclusion to the long nightmare." Tharoor also added that he had weathered dozens of unfounded accusations and media vilification patiently with the faith in Indian judiciary which totally stands vindicated today. We have to read on what basis the discharge has been allowed by the court but of course there was absolutely no evidence. 7 and a half years to decide the uh, application of discharge it's it's really unfortunate. The SIT of Delhi police took about 4 and a half years to conclude the investigation in fact they took one year to register the fir in this case sunanda pushkar was found dead lying on her hotel bed on the 17th of january 2014 her husband shashi tharoor said he left for the all india congress committee session without disturbing her because she hadn't slept well the night before a post mortem revealed no apparent reason for her death a week later delhi police investigators said she seemed to have died of hidden poisoning Then a year later the police registered a murder case against unknown people and 3 years later charged the MP with abetment to suicide. Sunanda's son Shiv Menon made a statement in the court backing Shashi Tharoor and said he would never have hurt his mother. It then took 3 years for the court to reserve its order in April this year and discharge Shashi Tharoor. From the beginning of the Tharoor Pushkar relationship it had been a volatile one. 
conducted in the glare of the public eye with allegations of IPL corruption, which even the Prime Minister raised in a public speech referring to Sunanda Pushkar as a 50 crore girlfriend and various BJP leaders taking pot shots at Tharoor after her death. He was at the center of a vitriolic media trial, causing him to go to court for protection. Mr. Shashi Tharoor is charged in a serious allegation of murder. And I don't want to give him more respect and prestige by responding to his baseless allegations. The Congress reacted in his support. The persistent abuse, slander, as also vilification of our colleague Shri Shashi Tharoor by branding him by BJP, Prime Minister and other BJP leaders as also a select group of TV anchors has finally been set to naught by a verdict of the court. Sources in Delhi police say that they are awaiting detailed verdict. After examination, the prosecution unit will take a call on challenging the special court order in higher courts. With camera person Sasi Kanja, this is Arvind Gunasekar for NDTV. Now more bad news on the household budget front. The price of non-subsidized LPG cylinder has been hiked by 25 rupees per cylinder. The prices are in fact up by 165 rupees since January this year. For the second consecutive month, LPG cooking gas prices have been increased. This time by as much as 25 rupees. In Chennai, many lower income households say they are already borrowing money to buy refills. For Ramya, the LPG hike of 50 rupees in three months comes on the back of her husband losing his job at a hotel. She's now been forced to take up a job as a receptionist at a doctor's clinic. We the people also lost our uh, jobs, salaries, everything. Why should they raise their cylinder rate now, uh, this pandemic situation, sir? In Kolkata, people are worried and angry. Since January, LPG prices are up 23%. With today's hike, now prices across metro cities are Delhi 859.5, Kolkata 886, Mumbai 859.5, Chennai 875.5. In Delhi, the Congress held a protest press conference with cow dung on the table. After increasing prices of petrol and diesel, now cooking gas hike will put a further burden on people who are already under stress because of pandemic and job cuts. Bureau Report, NDTV. With that time for us to slip into a short break. On the other side, we'll get you all the international stories. Stay with us. Finally, malnutrition is among the major contributors to disease burden in India. It is one of the chronic issues in the Melkart region of Maharashtra. While child malnutrition is the single biggest contributor to under-5 mortality, Racket is spreading awareness on malnutrition through their initiative Reach Each Child in Maharashtra. Here's a report. Nearly every third child in India is undernourished. An Amravati district in Maharashtra has been grappling with this burden for decades. But Rekit's initiative, Reach Each Child in the State, aims to reach every child in the fight against malnutrition. Navneet was in the severe acute malnourished category, but after the intervention, she's not only a healthy baby, but also a happier one. 
uh, we were able to provide the food security and health security both to her and her parents so basically this whole support was under the voucher scheme that we have provided to all the families which have the severely malnourished kids sir itna tabiyat kharab ho gaya tha ki uska halat ekdam sandas ulti bahut chalu ho gaya tha aur uske baad mein phir wo मैडम ने बताई कि वो सैम्प में वहाँ खाना मिलता है एन में जया मैडम ने बताया कि एन में भर्ती करो तो उसकी तबीयत अच्छी हो जाएंगे बोले वजन भी बढ़ता है फिर पैसे भी मिलते हैं ऐसे मैडम ने हमको समझा के बताई सर पैसे मिलते मुझे प्रतिदिन सौ रुपए रोज के हिसाब से मिलेंगे बोले बच्चे को खाना मिलेगा दूध मिलेगा उसका वजन भी बढ़ जाएगा ऐसे करके समझा के बताई सर हम मैंने बोले ठीक है मैडम हम भर्ती हो जाएंगे तब भी बच्चे का तबीयत भी बोलती संडा चालू है वजन भी कम है वजन तो अब छः किलो था सर उसमें और फिर वहाँ खाना पीना उसके खाना दवा गोली से तबीयत भी अच्छी हो गई और वजन भी चौदह दिन में आठ सौ ग्राम उसके बढ़ गए थे सर सर हम चौदह दिन भर्ती थे तो चौदह सौ मिले हाथ में और कैसी दे सर और और उसके बाद नवम्बर महीना में चार अकाउंट में आए सर इसके नवनीत के लिए खाना लाए सर खाना पीना कुछ काजू बादाम ऐसे फल फ्रूट लेके और उसकी तबीयत में खर्चे किए सर तो उसकी तबीयत भी तब से अभी खराब भी नहीं ना दवा खाना भी नहीं गए वो मैडम ने बताया उसके हिसाब से खाना पीना उसको चालू रखे तभी तक तबीयत भी खराब नहीं हुई सर उसकी और अभी अच्छी है Welcome you watching NDTV I'm Gargi Rawat external affairs minister Jay Shankar has said that India's priority is to ensure the safe return of Indians who are stuck in Afghanistan he said the evolving situation is being closely watched by India and the relationship with the Afghan people continues and that will guide India's approach in coming days The moment uh, we are like everybody else very carefully following developments in Afghanistan uh, I think our focus Uh, is on uh, ensuring the uh, security uh, in Afghanistan and the safe return of Indian nationals who are there uh, so that is really what has been uh, uh, very much the uh, focus of my own engagements uh, here you used the word investment i mean for us it reflected what was a historical relationship with the afghan people Uh, i think that relationship with the afghan people obviously continues and uh, that will guide our uh, approach to afghanistan uh, in the coming days we are uh, looking at uh, what is the situation evolving situation uh, in kabul uh, obviously the taliban and its representatives have uh, come to kabul so i think we need to take it on from there so thank you again very much So India's dilemma is whether to engage with the Taliban or not. Prime Minister has chaired a second meeting of the Cabinet Committee on Security yesterday. That was two meetings in two days. Can India trust the Taliban? Sanket Upadhyay reports. So should India engage with the Taliban or not? Well, as of this moment, it seems that the sense in the establishment is that we are playing a wait and watch game because the dilemma is whether we should engage and recognize with the Taliban or not. uh this is a huge dilemma because what bothers india is a taliban pakistan china nexus this time around china is in the mix so india uh, the the sense within the establishment is whether our interests will be protected in uh, afghanistan and also whether afghani soil will be used uh, uh, to carry out terror activities or not fears of taliban propelling terror in jk punjab and kerala is a huge matter of concern which has been raised by various mps also cabinet committee on security met on tuesday and wednesday in which uh, one of the key things that was addressed that our top priority is that we should evacuate all the indians who are stranded in afghanistan apart from that also offer refuge to afghan hindus as well as afghan sikhs as well so this is also a factor which is playing on the mind sources also say that the government wants to avoid an immediate hawkish position on taliban because they feel that that may not work because we have to uh, make sure that our interests are protected in afghanistan and that is also a major cause of concern we've also learned from sources that major key strategic commentators uh, who somewhat toe the government's line have also been told not to comment on the government uh, government's possible engagement or no engagement with the taliban 
uh, that is also something that we have learnt. One of the things which is fresh in public memory is the horrors of Kandahar and that is the biggest fear as of this moment, not just in, among the establishment but also among the people. People still, that memory, public memory of 1999 is still fresh. Now the UK envoy to India, Alex Ellis, has tweeted the situation in Afghanistan is very grave. UK and India have a prominent role to play in the international community's response. Well, to talk more about Afghanistan, we're now joined by Saeed, who is a, a citizen of Afghanistan, who returned from there a few days ago. And we also have Major General Ashwini Sivat, security analyst, joining us. Uh, first to you, Saeed, if you could tell us about the circumstances in which you left and your concerns. Good morning to you and the people who are watching us. Uh, when I came three days ago, the Taliban was attacked to my province, Takhar province. And uh, the first day they got to control of the Takhar, just they uh, create a panic to the people and hang out cheap person. Until uh, I came and uh, even the uh, shotgun is near to my home and shift my family to Kabul. Then I come to India, the collapse happened. And uh, the Taliban took control of the Kabul. And uh, it was a situation so much worse. And, uh, uh, and the you have family did. there? Your family is still there? Yeah, yeah. My, even the Taliban saw my video. They will find my family. They will treat us. And uh, that uh, uh, people on living and the, 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 the Taliban, they are not only one group. They are different group different idea, different law. They don't have any single law they follow. Whatever they saw in the media, suppose they told us that we forgave the people of Afghanistan. At the same time, they're killing people, like uh, hang, uh, hanging the Kandahar, some of our people, and in Kabul, they showed us. The, every day, they're searching the home and uh, beating the people, and, uh, and they uh, beat their honor, and uh, uh, self, uh, they so you're saying, you know, the, 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 this uh, image that we've seen that the Taliban is trying to portray is, is just optics, doing a press conference, you know, being interviewed by a woman, a newscaster. You're saying these are all optics, but the reality on the ground is very different? Yes, yes, yes. They are whatever they are saying, and actually they are not. It's uh, one group reject other group. They are different group inside. Uh, the, uh, the whatever they say in media. We will we uh, we will do this, um, but in reality, they will not do whatever whatever they can harm people. They will do it. Right, and uh, you know, th as everybody, the world is watching, and there are lots of reports coming out from the country. And while the Taliban are in control of Kabul and you know various parts of the country, there are also you know resistance. There are you know. Uh, there, there are certain uh, powerful entities in various parts. So there's also fears that there could be some sort of civil war if the situation doesn't settle. What is your view on that? If uh, the new government, not public, not uh, uh, new government by for six months, not started, might be the civil war will start. Again, the Taliban, the, the, the Daesh will be start from Dengahar, the uh, Amrullah Saleh in uh, Panjshir permit to start fight again, and the Taliban is no one supporting. It will be collapsed. It will be uh, gone. But the chaos happened to the to the to our people, and they they, they uh, lead to the next war, and uh, all of fear of that the name, that the becoming next war. All right, Major General Ashwini Sivach, your view right now, because, you know, India, we're, we're watching very closely. The Prime Minister has held meetings. Uh, we're waiting to see what sort of entity, you know, comes in control of the country and then what shape that takes. And, of course, whether there's going to be, you know, uh, more uh, trouble and violence, civil, uh, you know, violence within the country. Uh, yeah, Garki, first of all, the situation uh, in Afghanistan is very critical and fluid. You know, as far as uh, Afghanistan is concerned, possibly there is a chance of a unity uh, government coming. Uh, the reason is simple, because in case uh, Taliban forms a government, uh, it will not be accepted by a majority of the country. And they want acceptability, because financial condition of Afghanistan is very bad. But it is also true that Taliban is not a, a united house. There are divided house. There are a number of groups within Taliban. And Taliban has not changed a bit. They are uh, uh, saying something else, but on ground things are very different. They are showing the same brutality which was there from 1996 to 2001. 
but having said that i feel that the only possibility as on today is uh, you know bulla uh, abdul ghani brother has already come to kandha hamid karjai abdullah abdullah they all meet and form some sort of interim government and that only may be acceptable to majority of the country but you have to also take uh, into consideration uh, the challenge which is been given by amurullah saleh uh, which was the first uh, vice president earlier and declaring him a president and he, yes. he, and he in chang said he is gaining now momentum and uh, the masood uh, basically northern alliance is also with him and you find that uh, it is late though it is late i feel they, this could have been done slightly earlier because you know it is uh, something very strange that uh, the army of 3 to 4 lakh afghan forces which was well trained by the americans with equipped with a modern weapon how did they give it up the point is they never fought the leadership was poor. Yes. so now they are go- going to get together and they are trying to challenge uh, taliban and uh, taliban uh, to me it looks uh, it will be a challenge for them to do because the foot soldier of taliban are not listening to the leaders of taliban and taliban is a divided house there are right. number of groups know, within the taliban, taliban voices so were hearing fluent. Right. situation is fluent we have to watch it out my find is as for india is concerned it is the best policy is wait and watch and whichever government comes we have no choice to but to uh, start uh, you know our relationship with them as for indian the uh, concern the first priority is take out all indians safely from afghanistan that that is our priority number 1 you know remember there are 37 uh, projects which are still going on in yes. various parts of afghanistan there are some technician and engineer are still struck you have to get them out also so that is our priority number 1 and second is whenever a uh, interim government or unity government is formed we have no choice but to open some sort of uh, our relationship because uh, our investment is huge and heavy in afghanistan about 3 billion dollar and 1.8 billion dollar in chaba which is very important to our uh, national interest so my point is we along with other uh, neighboring uh, you know friendly country like uh, iran and to some extent russia must uh, try to evolve the strategy and uh, aim is as of today there is a still confusion the situation is still fluid the taliban is on ground is still behaving what they were uh, actually acting in a very indifferent manner from 1996 to 2001 what they are claiming and what is opening happening on ground are two different things however to me it looks like that the uh, interim unity government may be uh, the one which is likely to be formed but so, how amrullah and his uh, you know comrade give a challenge it is worth watching now if that happens then it will go toward a civil war and you will find a bloody war going taking place in taliban one must also understand that as far as the uh, you know afghanistan is concerned the demographic pattern does not permit the taliban can have a very safe route because they are only 42% pastoon There are right. 27% Pakistan, 9% Ujjayi, and 8% Azhar. We'll have to just wait and see what sort of you know form this dispensation takes, and then of course how stable it is. A final word, uh, Saeed. What are you? You've spoken about your fears and you know what the situation is, but what are your hopes? Right now, I cannot live under the if living under the flag or under the rule of the Islamic uh, Taliban. it's uh, punishable for the human re- human humanity the taliban is not they are illiterate they are bring the fear to the people not the peace for the people we I don't have any future i cannot go there if i if you debate with the taliban they will oh, they will shoot in your head and they they are i cannot describe how they are react with the people All and right. uh, Right, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much uh, for uh, speaking to us, and hope your family is safe. Thank you so much, General, for joining us this morning. With the time for us to slip into a short break, coming up on the other side, how the IMF has blocked funds for Afghanistan. Welcome back. Let's get to the latest COVID data that's been released by the Health Ministry. 56.64 crore vaccine doses have been administered so far under the nationwide vaccination policy. 36,401 new cases were detected in the last 
24 hours, the positivity rate is 1.94%. The Shopping Centre Association of uh, the Indian Industry for Shopping Malls has expressed its inability to reopen malls in Mumbai with the conditions that were announced in the relaxations. Employees working in the mall need to have taken both doses of the vaccine. Here's a report. After five months of closure, malls in Mumbai finally opened on August 15. But the industry body for malls says it's impossible to function as the condition of having received two doses of vaccine to enter malls was a major hurdle. As a result, the Shopping Centre Association of India has decided to close malls again. The association says 80% of employees in malls are between the age of 18 to 44 who have not been able to get two doses due to the rule that stipulates an 84-day gap between doses. A solution they suggest could be reducing the mandatory gap between two doses. Unfortunately, the condition to have double vaccination done for staff is causing hindrance. Most of the employees were not able to get their vaccination because they have to wait for the mandatory period. If that mandatory period is reduced and we go back to the earlier period where it was only 40 days or uh, 6 weeks, then most of the people will become eligible for second dose. There are about 90 malls and shopping centres in Maharashtra. Estimates suggest that about 2 lakh employees work in these malls which generate a turnover of 40 to 45,000 crore rupees annually. With restrictions announced as a result of the second wave, business has been hit for the second consecutive year. Losses are huge. You know, Maharashtra alone has nearly 80 to 90 malls of various sizes. And if you look at each mall, uh, brings in a consumption base of 200 crore to maybe some of the regional centers which are a million square feet plus they do business of around 1400 crore in a year and if we are shut for five months is a big business loss. The association is appealing to the chief minister of the top rate to reconsider the condition of allowing only those who have taken both doses to work in malls to save businesses and livelihoods. Malls in Mumbai and Maharashtra are going to remain shut till there are further relaxations or they find enough staff who are doubly vaccinated. And in a devastating year, this is going to cause further loss of income for businesses and further loss of revenue for the government as well. In Mumbai with camera person Praveen Ji Rohit, Saurabh Gupta, NDTV. News from the Northeast now in Shillong, where the curfew imposed on the 15th of August was relaxed for the first time yesterday, four days after the sporadic violence that also saw a petrol bomb being hurled at the personal residence of the chief minister and the governor's convoy being targeted. Locals uh, in the disturbed area have decided not to join the peace committee set up by the Meghalaya government until the government suspends senior police officers who they blame for the death of a rebel leader who had surrendered in 2018. Ratadeep Chaudhary reports. Curfew relaxed in Shillong for 11 hours, markets open, taxis back on the roads for the first time since 15 August when the violence erupted over the killing in a police raid of surrendered rebel leader Chesterfield. Thank you. With a curfew relaxed, Shillong is limping back to normalcy, but there is an uneasy calm with sentiments high about the manner in which the former militant leader was gunned down by the police. In the Mola area of Shillong, where violence broke out on Sunday, people are back on the street, along with the central forces on patrol. But the crucial meeting between the government and the locality representatives has not broken the ice. Locals have issued an ultimatum. The government, they say, must act against the police officers in the controversial raid within seven days. That until unless you suspend or book this culprit, these two murderers, these two police who led the, the mothers, the barbaric and on, on the morning of 13. So we will come and we will have uh, a seat in, this, in that peace committee. So we told the chief minister that you should retain the trust of the public, of the Maulai. You should show the sincerity, the capable that you have. As the CM, you can lead the state. The opposition Congress is also gunning for the chief minister, who is keeping up a brave face and even defending the police. Even before the independent inquiry is notified, the chief minister has been giving statement, defending the police and talking about the circumstances. It's not inconsistent with what is expected. We have been now reaching out to 
large number of uh, uh, seniors, citizens of society, the headmen's, the different organizations. And to a large extent, uh, we have been able to positively uh, move forward in this. That's why today you have seen a relaxation in the curfew. We have, uh, in fact, put in a judicial inquiry. And he had, in fact, himself uh, mentioned in the letter that a judicial inquiry should be put in. When everything is, um, you know, uh, okay, uh, the uh, uh, general sense um, uh, don't realize uh, or uh, individuals don't realize the amount of work that the police is putting in to ensure that there is calmness and peacefulness. The tension in Shillong is tangible. The crisis for the government far from over. In Shillong with cameras and Sanjay Chakravarti, Rafandeep Chaudhary, Findy TV. The Calcutta High Court is set to deliver its verdict on the controversial post-poll violence case in Bengal. A five-judge bench had reserved its order on the 3rd of August in the case examining the charge of allegations of the Trinamool violence against the BJP after the polls ended on the 2nd of May with a thumping win for Mamta Banerjee. The court ordered an NHRC probe into the allegations, but its report turned controversial after its reports claiming a Bengal police had turned a blind eye on rapes and murders in the state after the polls with Mamta Banerjee dismissing the NHRC report claiming it was biased as members of its team were publicly known to be BJP loyalists. Well, let's go across uh, to Moni Deepa now for more. And Moni, so this is a very, very key uh, decision or verdict of uh, the High Court that's awaited. That's right. For three months, this case has been going on at the Calcutta High Court based on a number of public interest litigations by, uh, you know, people claiming to be victims of the post-poll violence. And so this case has now sort of culminated into an order, a judgment, perhaps today. On 3rd of August, uh, you know, the case hearing had ended, but the judges had reserved their order because of, uh, you know, extremely contentious, extremely controversial uh, issues issues that erupted during the hearing of the case. Uh, one of them, of course, was an attack on a team that the NHRC had set up uh, to, uh, you know, probe into the allegations of violence. That happened in Calcutta end of June. After that came the NHRC report which Mamta Banerjee and the Trinamool Congress uh, objected to and questioned roundly because they felt it was biased. Uh, the judges, of course, uh, sat through the whole thing and the last argument that we heard was uh, Mr. Kapil Sibyl claiming that the NHRC committee, the NHRC team, that was all unconstitutional. Uh, therefore, today, all eyes on what the Calcutta High Court has to say on post-poll violence. Mamta Banerjee denies any post-poll violence. The BJP claims it is the Mamta Banerjee government that has turned a blind eye to the violence after 2nd of May. All right, a big political story there. Thanks so much, Moni, for joining us. Well, uh, look now at uh, questions that people often have about COVID and about vaccines. Now for our special campaign, Vaccinate India in partnership with Google, where we bring you questions that people have about the vaccines, about coronavirus. And to answer those questions, we're joined by Dr. Kirti Sabnes, infectious disease specialist at Fortis Hospital, Kalyan. Thank you so much, doctor, for joining us. And one of the questions that people often look up is, are COVID vaccines safe? Uh, COVID vaccines are safe. Uh, generally, vaccines have side effects which are um, not very common. Like if you vaccine, uh, suppose like a million people, one or two of them will develop side effects, which are very really serious. Smaller side effects, like actually makes that vaccine are working, are local pain at the site, uh, sometimes small bouts of fever. So COVID vaccines by and large are safe. Right, and that's the message we really need to get out there as, you know, we're trying to ensure that people come forward, take the vaccines in, in cities and in rural areas as well. And there the messaging also has to be, uh, you know, a bit different, but to ensure that people have confidence in the vaccines. Sure, but they, small, uh, small bouts of fever and pain, people should not be worried about. They should go ahead and take it because it's a larger picture for protection from COVID. All right. Another question that people often look up is how do mRNA vaccines work? We don't have any mRNA vaccines yet, but, uh, you know, Moderna and Pfizer, there's been a lot of talk and, and how they're the, you know, modern vaccines, how their efficacy is much higher. Uh, you see, mRNA vaccines are not new. People are working for that for last almost five to ten years. 
Now that's why we could develop the vaccine for COVID uh, a little faster than normal vaccines which we develop because the work was already going on for COVID-like vaccines. So we should not be worried about that how the rapidly vaccines are developed or this is a new technology. No, this has been there, but we are, we are it's more in public in last one or year or so. So mRNA vaccines are made uh, because it's a little uh, technical uh, discussion that mRNA uh, vaccines are made for, uh, against the one replicating component of, of a virus. So its efficacy is higher uh, and uh, doses related side effects are little less. So uh, it's, an, it's not a new technology actually. Right and uh, it, it, as you said the efficacy is higher also uh, yes. with the Delta variant it, it is still found to be uh, quite effective though the efficacy does come down somewhat. Yes, actually there have been studies because Delta Plus and Delta both are in uh, discussion since last four, three to four months and there are studies which are published from UK and South Africa both for um, uh, mRNA as well as uh, our uh, uh, COVID shield which is an Oxford based vaccine. Uh, the efficacy does come down but with two doses the efficacy is around 70% uh, which is quite good to protect from a serious illness. Uh, see, vaccines are not like 100% they are going to prevent you from COVID, but definitely they will reduce the severity of the illness and also uh, chance of getting COVID is reduced by around 70%, which is not a, a, a bad number. So if you're getting at least, see, because it's a respiratory virus, as we are discussing all the time, uh, you can't prevent it from getting because it's a respiratory virus. So at least you get back taking by vaccine, you can prevent the severity that you can prevent getting landing, landing up on a ventilator or in an ICU, which is also a fair uh, amount of protection given by the vaccine. Right. And now, uh, you know, countries are going in for a third shot, a booster dose. Is this something that, you know, we're going to right now, of course, in India, the focus is on covering as many people as we can. Uh, but going forward, uh, is this something that you're going to we're going to see here as well? Yeah, as I said, again, this is a respiratory virus. We know a very good example of a respiratory virus is an influenza, which is a common flu virus. And we know that people who have weaker in immunity, we give them yearly flu vaccine. So this is going to be somewhat like that. The picture is not yet clear, but yes. currently the recommendation is for the third booster only for people who have a weaker immunity, who can't mount good, robust immune response after two doses of vaccination. What we have seen, like uh, there is a data in healthcare workers who have been vaccinated at the beginning of the year, January, February, they still have quite a good amount of antibodies produced by two doses of vaccine. There is an, There are quite a bit of Indian studies also available. So I think right now we should focus in covering at least two doses because it will give protection against Delta and Delta Plus which is coming up and uh, then for the weaker immunity part like people who have on undergone transplants, people who have under, on chemotherapy, people who are on immunosuppression drugs for some other purposes, we can reserve the third dose for them as the time comes. All right. Well, thank you so much, doctor, for speaking to us. Yeah, thank you. Welcome back. Well, it's time now to take a look at the weather. Let's go across to Divya for more. And Divya, a monsoon revival? Absolutely, Gargi. Monsoon's been missing in action in the northern part of the country, but all that is set to change because a comeback is expected from today. In fact, uh, lots of showers expected over the weekend. Uh, showers are going to get heavier starting uh, tomorrow. Let's take into account how monsoon has been so far and all these areas in the red that you see, especially in the northern part of the country, is where monsoon has been deficit. Also in areas of Rajasthan, Gujarat, Saurashtra and Kutch, Orisha. Also in parts of Kerala, we also have the northeastern states which are, haven't been faring so well, especially in Manipur where the deficit is almost 60%. Let's uh, take into account the deficit that stands as far as the country is concerned and that's coming in at 9%. As far as the north is concerned, the deficit is now 10%. 11% in the east, central India, some improvement there from 13% yesterday, now coming in at 11%. But in the southern part, no change there. 5% uh, surplus just like yesterday. Let's uh, take into account the kind of showers we're expecting in Uttarakhand. There's an orange, uh, this is an amber alert uh, for these areas, which means heavy showers are expected there. Also, if you can see, it's going to start 
training in the national capital and adjoining areas, whether it's Chandigarh, Haryana, also in parts of Punjab and West Uttar Pradesh, going all the way into Rajasthan as well as Madhya Pradesh. Widespread showers expected in Gujarat, some showers expected in Maharashtra, Konkan, Goa, and of course, we it's the northeastern states, especially South Man and West Bengal, as well as Sikkim, along with Assam and Meghalaya, where showers are likely to get heavy in the coming uh, 24 hours. So what about tomorrow? Can we expect uh, more showers? Yes, uh, the concentration will be in the northern part of the country where, uh, in fact, the temperatures are up uh, almost 3 to 5 degrees from what's uh, usually expected. And all that is set to change. In fact, the temperatures are likely to dip uh, starting tomorrow. Let's take into account what are the temperatures more than 42 degrees in Churu, more than 42 degrees in Sri Ganganagar, Jaisalmer just under 40 degrees and as far as the Delhi uh, national capital is concerned, there 38 degrees uh, Celsius, uh, no change since yesterday, the temperature stays uh, Gwalior even uh, hotter than uh, Delhi, Agra almost 38 degrees, so it feels really hot as far as the northern plains are concerned. What about the hilly areas also, you can see the temperatures are up uh, almost uh, 4 degrees in uh, Shimla, also in parts of, uh, in fact, a Masuri, where the temperature is uh, 2 to 3 degrees more than it should be at this point in time. Srinagar also more than usual, crossing uh, more than 30 degrees. So the temperatures are likely to also change because the weather is likely to change in the northern part of the country. So Gargi, yes, a huge comeback, a revival from the monsoon. Gargi? All right, Divya, thanks so much for joining us with that. And finally, malnutrition is among the major contributors to disease burden in India. It's one of the chronic issues of the Melghat region of Maharashtra. While child malnutrition is the single biggest contributor to under-5 mortality, Reckitt is now spreading awareness on malnutrition through their initiative, Reach Each Child in Maharashtra. Here's a report. Nearly every third child in India is undernourished. And Amravati district in Maharashtra has been grappling with this burden for decades. But Reckitt's initiative, Reach Each Child in the State, aims to reach every child in the fight against malnutrition. Navneet was in the severe acute malnourished category, but after the intervention, she's not only a healthy baby, but also a happier one. We were able to provide the food security and health security both to her and her parents. So basically this whole support was under the voucher scheme that we have provided to all the families which have the severely malnourished kids. Sir, it was so bad that 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 it was so bad. And after that, Madam told me that she had to eat in the same way, in the NRC. She told me that she had to eat in the NRC. तो उसकी तबीयत अच्छी हो जाएंगी बोले वजन भी बढ़ता है क्योंकि पैसे भी मिलते हैं ऐसे मैडम ने हमको समझा के बताई थी पैसे मिलते मुझे प्रतिदिन सौ रुपए रोज के हिसाब से मिलेंगे बोले बच्चे को खाना मिलेगा दूध मिलेगा उसका वजन भी बढ़ जाएगा ऐसे करके समझा के बताई थी हम मैंने बोले ठीक है मैडम हम भर्ती हो जाएंगे तबे बच्चे का तबे भी भूलती संडा चालू है वजन भी कम है वजन तो अब छः किलो था सर उसमें और फिर वहाँ खाना पीना उसके खाना दवा गोली से तबीयत भी अच्छी हो गई और वजन भी चौदह दिन में आठ सौ ग्राम उसके बढ़ गए थे सर सर हम चौदह दिन भरती थे तो चौदह सौ रुपये मिले हाथ में और कैसी दे सर और और उसके बाद नवंबर महीना में चार हजार सात सौ रुपये अकाउंट में आए सर इसके नवनीत के लिए खाना लाए सर खाना पीना कुछ काजू बादाम ऐसे फल फ्रूट लेके और उसकी तबीयत में खर्चे किए सर तो उसकी तबीयत भी तब से अभी खराब भी नहीं ना दवा खाना भी नहीं गए वो मैडम ने बताया उसके हिसाब से खाना पीना उसको चालू रखे तभी तक तबीयत भी खराब नहीं हुई सर उसकी और अभी अच्छी है